Now an exception signals the occurrence of an error or an unusual situation. And the thing about exceptions is that they will abruptly interrupt normal processing. If possible, the programs should handle the problem at the point of detection. Sometimes that's not possible or not desirable and therefore it needs to be passed back up the call stack, the method call stack. So in our situation where we have internet applications, then you'll have a servlet that will invoke another servlet. And if an exception occurs, if it can't be handled within the invoked servlet, we'll need to pass the exception back to the invoking servlet. Now exceptions can be thrown, that is occur, in two ways. Implicitly by performing some kind of illegal operation, such as A equals B divided by C. There's nothing specifically illegal about that. Unless, of course, C has the value zero, and then that causes problems. This will be detected by the runtime environment, and the exception will be thrown by the runtime environment. Or we could do this explicitly. Perhaps we have detected some kind of error situation that we in our program can't deal with, and therefore we can explicitly throw a new instance of some exception or other. For example, within our servlets, we can throw a new servlet exception. So we use the reserved word throw, and then we create a new instance of the servlet exception class. And the string that we put here is essentially the error message. And we'll be able then to retrieve that error message at some other point. Details of that coming up. Now where an exception might occur, in other words, where there could be some statements in your Java code that might cause an exception to be thrown, then we can guard against that by using a try-catch block. So those statements that could potentially cause some exceptions to be thrown will be put inside the try block. So that's introduced with the reserve word try. And then in between the open brace and the close brace, we have the statements that are being guarded by the try block. Then we'll put one or more catch blocks. And in the parameter list here, we simply list the type of exception that this block is going to catch. The statements that will be executed if that exception is caught. We could also put in a finally block if we want to. And this block of statements will be executed either after the try or after the catch. But the point is that it will always be executed. So by uh, way of illustration then, let us assume that the statements in the try block when this block is executed causes no exception to be thrown. There's no error detected at all. It all executes normally. Great, that's what we would hope would occur. Therefore, no exception is thrown. When the try block has finished executing, all the catch blocks are skipped and the finally block is executed. On the other hand, if a statement in the try block either implicitly or explicitly causes an exception to be thrown, the catch blocks, if there's more than one of them, will, will be consulted to see if any one of them will have a parameter that matches the exception that's been thrown. So for example, if this were a number format exception that's thrown and we've got catch number format exception, then this catch block will be executed. And having executed the catch block, the finally block will then be executed too. So this parameter is going to refer to some object of some exception class. Right at the top of the class hierarchy is the exception class. So if we were just to put in here catch exception e, e being the name of the parameter, then that catch block would handle every single kind of exception that could be thrown. On the other hand, we might want to be a little bit more specific. Here, instead of the exception class, we could nominate one of its subclasses. So some rules about catch and finally blocks. A try block may have zero or more associated catch blocks. A try block may have zero or one finally block. And a try block has to have at least one of them. You cannot have zero catch blocks and zero finally blocks. So as I mentioned earlier, when an exception is thrown, if it is going to be caught, it'll be caught by one of those catch blocks that is listed. And if you have more than one catch block, well, the parameters have to be different on each of the catches. You can't have 
catch exception followed by catch exception. That doesn't make sense. So you have to have different exception classes in each of the catch parameter lists. And the way that it's searched, well, is top to bottom. And so the first occurring catch will be examined to see if its parameter matches the type of exception that's thrown. If it is, it's executed. If it isn't matching, then the next catch block, if there is one, will be examined. If that matches, then that is executed. If it doesn't match and there's another catch block, then that will be consulted. Eventually, one of two things will happen. There will be a matching catch block, or there won't. If there is a matching catch block, the first one that matches that exception parameter is going to be executed. If there isn't a matching catch block, this catch block cannot handle it, and therefore the method is terminated, and that probably means that the servlet finishes execution abnormally and early, and control will go back to the invoking servlet. If that servlet has got a try-catch block to handle it, then it'll be dealt with there. Otherwise, it'll be passed back out to each invoking servlet in turn until there are no other invoking servlets, at which point the servlet container on the web server will deal with it. And it deals with it by spitting out for the user some rather unfriendly looking kind of messages and therefore we don't really want that to occur.